Hello guys and gals and MB pals. This is Drawn Talk and today on Drawn Talk there's gonna be we're gonna draw my new original character called Mr Mr. Pernghosten. Gonna draw him and we're gonna talk about him a little bit. But I'm also gonna be talking about variety of things um i've got this whole list here of things that i would like to talk about today on the show it's quite a long list so i might be popping in and out from the actual the actual drawn as i am um, look at uh, what I want to say oh just close Spotify Spotify is open um that's no good I don't want Spotify to be open I have desktop audio muted but I don't know if, if you know the lore of draw and talk if you don't I should say um the first episode, like the first episode I ever recorded of the show is completely ruined because I had Spotify open and it was playing stuff in the background the whole time. I had no idea the audio from me and the audio from Spotify all on the same layer and just completely unusable. But yeah. So I'm quite paranoid about that. I almost didn't do draw and talk this week. Because I've been dealing with some... Hmm, where's a good place to start? I want to start on the face, but like it's very complicated. Like, Do the hair, I guess? There's always a good place to start. Anyways, um, almost did do draw and talk this week. My cat is making some lovely noises in the background <laughs> because I was dealing with some mental health problems. I guess um, and this morning I've really been able to um, figure out what the problem was and really what the what the problem was is that um, Well, I shouldn't talk about the problem first. I should talk about what was what was even going on with me. I just I was like, I've been coming out of like a depression, a quite bad depression about feeling like feeling like you know I don't matter, that I'm bad, that I'm invalid, all that all that kind of stuff. I used to like obsess over my body image and my dysphoria and comparing myself to others and I'm finally starting to overcome that and yeah I've started to overcome that and for the most part that's been really freaking good but it's also been a di bit difficult to adjust to that because it's like I have so much excess energy I guess I can finally focus on other things and for the most part like that's awesome but I'm starting I'm seeing the world in a, in a weird new way a way where my like self-loading isn't necessarily at the center of it anymore and it is weird and the way I started to conceptualize that 
today, this morning, like, I have a hunch that, like, I'm still seeing, like, even if I'm not feeling depressed necessarily, especially, like, I still get sad, I still feel sad about stuff, but, and I'm still susceptible to depression, and going into a depression like I have over the last few days, but the root cause of what was, like, causing most of my depression, I've kind of dealt with that, but I still having that depression-based mindset where the world revolves around depression. So all of yesterday, most of yesterday, I was kind of, I was moping about because I felt like I have all this energy now. I want to help people. I want to, I want to do this. I want to do that. And what I noticed is that the things that I was doing, like, like draw and talk, you know, people were happy for me that I was doing them, but, you know, people weren't as happy as maybe I, I'd expected or I'd hope. And I was like, oh, people aren't happy for me because, you know, they're dealing with their own stuff. And now that I have all this energy, I, sh I should help them with the with their own stuff. And But it don't work like that. And I started to feel like, really feel like that was like maybe my only way I could have work to people being their therapist and I'm always and this is a toxic pattern that I fall into where I try to be people's therapists because I think I think that I think like that's like where I get any work from and I think like maybe part of the reason I think I think that sometimes is because you know, that's what people were to me when I was really depressed. It was like, are you helpful or are you unhelpful? And that's horrible. I mean, that's what depression does to you. Like, especially when I was trying to actually get over it. I was like, is this person helping me or are they not? Like, I wasn't able to... Some days I wasn't really able to enjoy life properly wasn't able to really like hang out with people or anything like that so I forgot I forgot I stopped stopped taking note of the fact that people are more than just being helpful people are more than just supporting you people can be funny people's company can be enjoyable and people can have worth outside of um work to other people outside of just how how good they are at being a bleeding therapist <clears throat> uh, being your bleeding therapist that shouldn't be where their work lies but after coming out of that depression that's what i kind of thought i was like Oh man, everyone's so sad. I gotta fix that. I gotta fix that. Just like they, they help me fix it. You know? But It's good to help people. It's good to support people. Especially if they're coming to you for that help. But you can't force that on them. You can't help someone when they're not ready for that. I was ready for that. You know, this period in my life I'm talking about, I was ready to be helped in that way. But not everyone is. Not everyone is ready for that. So, what... What... But I still, like, I was I was really sad yesterday. Like, I, I didn't want to do anything. Didn't know what I wanted to do. You know? Because I've been trying to recharge. Because I've been working really hard on 
art and skateboarding and this show and I really wanted to recharge. I was playing games and none of it was really doing it for me, to be honest. Um, I mean, the games were fun. Um, but then, then yesterday I was like, okay, I'm getting pizza today. I feel awful. I don't want to cook food. I want to, I want to have pizza because pizza is my comfort food. Um, is very much my my comfort food so that's what I wanted I wanted to have pizza and, and the way I imagined it going is you know I'd have um, pizza and I'd feel kind of miserable and I'd eat my feelings and you know I'd wake up today and I'd do it all again um, just fall back into depressed habits because I, the way I was thinking at the time, I was like, "Oh, people like me better when I'm depressed, anyways. When I'm when I'm happy and I'm trying to help them, they they don't like that. They respond bad to that. But at least when I'm depressed and and they're helping me, like they're giving me positive responses. But this is that's the way I was thinking at the time." But then we got pizza, and I got pizza for everyone in the family ended up wanting pizza that day. Uh, my mom wanted pizza, my brother wanted pizza, my boyfriend wanted pizza. And so me and my boyfriend ended up um, watching, uh, we love to watch um, this lad's 8-bit guy, we love to watch him, and we kind of we gently we gently make a little bit of fun of him because he says some interesting stuff sometimes but he he seems like a he seems like a decent guy i mean but, but we like to watch his content we genuinely like it um we were watching that and we were eating pizza and the pizza tasted really nice and me and him were making loads of jokes and i was like this isn't depression pizza anymore is it what's what's gone happened to my depression pizza like this is this is happy pizza this isn't what i ordered but it was happy pizza and i embraced the happy pizza because you know i've no reason not to anymore like i've no reason to say no i don't want the happy pizza i'm freaking sad because what i'm sad about is like I didn't really understand what I was sad about until now. What I was sad about was not having the happy pizza. Because I was finally ready to have the happy pizza. And instead of having the happy pizza, I was trying to have the freaking therapy pizza with people. But it went, it was nice and we were making jokes and... He told me loads of stuff about Crazy Frog, which is what inspired what I'm gonna talk about later on. Gonna talk a bit about Crazy Frog. Um, and then, you know, I felt a little bit better, but I was still going to bed thinking, um, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be depressed tomorrow. I'm gonna be sad. You know, I'm, I'm not helpful. I'm not helpful to people. I don't help people like they help me. I'm just, I'm just a nuisance. I don't want to live this life where, you know, even if I feel better about myself, I can't help people. I'm just selfish. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, and then we woke up early. We woke up at, um, 3am and I was looking at the news on my phone and and I saw news from like just a little bit ago that was like oh there's meteor showers going on and this night this night really late this night early in the morning aka 3am there's gonna be freaking meteor shower and that's the best time to, to watch it 
so I said to my boyfriend, um, hey, let's let's go out and watch this, you know, there's no reason not to, I've never gotten to see one of these before, like, we have, we've woken up at the perfect time, so that's exactly what we did, and it was beautiful, and it was lovely, and it was nice, and my boyfriend, like, he's been struggling with some stuff lately, and I've been... I've been doing this, all this kind of stuff where I'm like, this is, this is what you gotta do for your mental health and all that, like, kind of stuff. And, but I think probably the best thing I could have done for him was, like, doing that. Like, going out and having a good time with him then. Like, that's, that's much better for him than any of that stuff I was doing prior, like, and that, I only realised that then, I only realised that today, that I have value outside of being, like, a good therapist, or being a good, um, being a good emotional support, like, I can, like, I can do all this stuff that I miss doing, like, hanging out with people, like, not that I wasn't able to do it when I was dealing with all those feelings. But I... There were so many times where I was like, I'm just not able for that. I would love to. I'd love to do this with you. But I just can't because I feel so horrible. And I, oh, that's all I can think about right now. There's nothing that will distract me from it as much as I try. You know, and I missed being able to to hang out with people. And now I can, and I have work in that capacity. I can have work to people beyond just being helpful, like mental health wise. I can, I can be funny. I can be. Um, I'm not saying I am all these things all the time, but like, like I can be these things to people. These are things I can work towards. Um be funny, you can be fun to hang around, you can be, you can provide people company in that way, and like other ways too, I'm sure that I'm not really thinking about, you can, you can just provide that for people just by having fun and being your, yourself really. And I didn't really think of that because I forgot that people could do that, I forgot that people could make me laugh or be fun or anything like that because I was because even though those depressing thoughts had gone away like I said I still think I was seeing the world through depression and I probably still am I probably still am I probably need to work on that because I don't want to be susceptible to relapsing into it I don't I don't want that to happen again like so badly and like yesterday like I was having a talk like I started having a talk about like my gender and like oh I wish I was I wish I was um, like them and I could say that kind of stuff that they're saying about their gender and that would make me feel valid and good and my brain was just like shut the hell up stop saying that you know you know how bad these kinds of thoughts are and I was like oh shiz you're, you're right I mean we've kind of tackled this before haven't we haven't we gotten over this and that's the interesting thing. Like, I think I can provide good mental health. Like, at least in some capacity, I think I could provide good mental health um, advice to some people. Like, especially if it's about this kind of... I could tell someone how to stop feeling jealous of trans people further along in their transition i could give good advice about that i could how body image issues intersect 
with gender, how being autistic intersects with that and the shame of that and just shame and the shame of like being gay and not feeling like you're gay enough because of this, that and the other. Like, I could give good advice on that. You know, I think I could. Like, obviously, like, it's not going to work on everyone. You know, everyone's got different things that are going to work for them. But I do think that could, like, help some people, like, talking about that. But I want to talk about that on a, on this show. I don't want to give unsolicited advice, to, to especially to friends. I don't want to do that anymore. And I don't want to, like, even if they ask for advice, I, I, I used to... Well, I probably still will. Like, I'm working on it. Like just go overboard like with information this happened to me and that happened to me and that's how I got over time this is how I did this and you know it's not helpful because me learning all this stuff it took years it took it I didn't just learn all of that all at once it was trial and error and it wasn't even just thinking about it it was going out and doing stuff and that helping me as well like You know, if I try to condense that really quickly, talk about it really quickly to someone who's dealing with similar, I'm just gonna alienate them. I might even make them feel ashamed. I might be like, why aren't you better yet? You know, like, I don't want to be that person. And I don't think I have to be that person anymore because I feel like there is like a way from my work to to come from somewhere else there is and I found that now and like I, I'm not gonna say oh this, this bad behavior is never gonna happen again because like I really feel like this is just the first step and talking about it on the show kind of cements it because yesterday I was like I don't want to do draw and talk anymore nobody likes nobody likes the show you know no one's gonna watch it. And what's the point of doing draw and talk if if other if it if it doesn't fulfil other people like what's that point? You know, but there is the point is in doing it, like the point is the process because I enjoy doing this. I enjoy drawing and talking and I love editing the video. I love uploading it and, you know, picking out all the bits with um, content warnings, which, by the way, look at the description for content warnings. Um, I love picking the music out that's going to be in it. and I love doing that, so why would I stop doing that? And I love, like, I love the results that I get from it. You know, it's not always going to be perfect, but but I'm happy with it. I believe in it. So, of course I should do it. It's good for my mental health. And if I, if I enjoy doing it, if I enjoy making it, and I believe in the results that I get out of it, then there's going to be at least, like, a few other people out there in this fast world that's, that would find value in it as well, I believe. So... That's good. It doesn't have to, the value doesn't have to come from like, it like directly helping people. Sometimes I'd say the best way to help people is to just, you know, if they they aren't ready to be helped in that emotionally supportive way, you sometimes you just gotta step off, sometimes what they really want well I've seen some people say this like actually quite openly on the internet like say uh, people with depression saying stuff like when I'm around my friends I just want to feel normal for a little bit and you know that wasn't really my experience of depression most of the time but like a lot of other people felt feel that way so I have to like I can provide that and you can provide that without doing any of this like overbearing stuff that 
I've gotten accustomed to doing over the last while. So for anyone, like, I, I doubt this is going to be relevant to most people, but anyone out there that's recovering from bad mental health, depression, anxiety, all that, I, I just, just be careful not to do what I did, where you're still, you're still viewing the world through that lens, even if the thing that stopped making you feel so bad is gone and dealt with. You could still be on high alert and you still could still be viewing the world like through that lens for a very long time and i assume i assume this is going to be the hard part for me rooting out like as i transition and as i feel better about myself this is going to be the hard part for getting these impulses i feel like i've repeated myself a lot i should probably move on I really wanted to talk about that and I feel like I'm going to learn a lot of stuff and my opinions on this part of my life might change and I'll, I'll let you guys know but now we're going to talk about Mr. Perngo Stens. Perngo Stens, this is how you do it. Perngo Stens, that, that, that's his name gonna talk about this lad's law i'm really happy with how his hair is coming out by the way um yeah he looks looks very pretty even though he's a very like fuzzy hairy man um but anyways he is like an imp and I've been talking about the lore I've been crafting with him with my boyfriend like I've been talking about the lore that I've been giving him I was like because I'll be honest at this character I only started making them because like I was I was watching the new Lindsay Ellis video and I just wanted something to do with my hands because I just wanted to stim a bit so I started drawing whatever was fun to draw and along came this lad and he is very fun to draw, he's loads of stuff that I love drawing, like the big pointy ears and the curly hair and the, the tail and whatever, he's fun. I tried drawing him with um these kind of legs, what are they called? God, what are they? I'm going to look it up because I hate being... Like, I have Google. I'm going to use Google as a resource. Alright, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it is called... I believe it's called a digit... Digitigrade. A, a digitigrade. A digitigrade type for... Type V. Type... Leg. Right? Digitigrade, right? I, I try them with that and it just doesn't work on him. Probably because of all the leg hair. It just doesn't look right. It just it just doesn't look right. <laughs> um, uh, right. Oh. But this is... He's very fun to draw. No, yeah, I just started drawing him like that. Um, my boyfriend hates his law. Absolutely hates his law. Um, the law is... And I think you'll probably hate his law as well, unless you're a certain type of person. Even I hate his law. I made him. I hate his law. Um, he loves for him. Um... It's all he cares about. He's obsessed with it. It's all. It's all he wants to do. He he's a person that like he's he's an imp. That's that's what he is. I don't really know what an imp is, but I look at him and I say that's an imp. So he he does care about his hygiene. He 
he does wash and he does like he eats a vegan diet and like he does care about animal rights but the primary thing with the vegan diet is that he loves is he loves that it makes him fart a lot um he loves that about it you know like he wouldn't be as he would still be invested but he wouldn't be as invested if it didn't really do that like he'd be tempted if something else like helped him in his in his journey um but he does care about himself takes great care of himself and he smells really good like he actually he actually enjoys that he smells really good because like it contrasts with the bad the bad bum smell a lot and he really likes that now like when he talks to people this is like the first thing they'll find out about him so it's never a surprise when he just he lets one off like it's not a surprise to people when that happens it's like the fr he will tell you that he loves farting before he tells you his name so it's like the first thing you know about him so it's all like so when he subjects people to his bad smell like you know people at least know what they're in for and he he sees that as like a very um important part of it now i wasn't i was almost going to draw him for him but um I talk like I'm gonna be talk. I'm talking a lot about mental health in this episode, so I want him to at least be somewhat presentable. I mean, he's still a very, a very stinky imp. Even if he smells really good, he's actually really stinky. So, yeah, like, but that's his lore. Is there any? Is there anything else I can add to that? anything else we want to know about him he's 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 cheeky i guess and he's obsessed with that does he have any like because he can't just be obsessed with one thing like what else does he do probably um knits in his spare time probably does that i don't know you come up with law for him all right i'll make it canon you come up with the law i'll make it canon And I'm trying out new things stylistically here, if you've noticed. Um, I really like how this is coming out. Like, I knew this this drawn like when I, when I finished the sketch, I was like, this is gonna take a while, but that's perfect because I have so much stuff that I want to talk about. Let's see, what else do I want to talk about? Um, I wanted to talk about Planet Zoo a little bit. I've been playing Planet Zoo lately. And I think I'm gonna make a video about it because I've, I've made like, like, I I'm playing the game as intended. I'm making a nice zoo. I'm looking after the animals. I'm. It's a very nice zoo. You, you would enjoy visiting it. It's called Cat World. It is a lovely zoo to visit. It is absolutely lovely but i'm also it's also like it's also got like some weird stuff going on just because of the nature of the game like i'm actually like this is like playing it as intended supremely because because of two things it lets you rename almost everything Almost everything Planet Zoo lets you rename the enclosures, the habit, the habitats, the like, the the rubbish bins, the shops. It lets you rename them. Um, so I went ahead and I did that, and I've renamed. Like I go ahead, like whenever I see something, I try to rename it. Cause what I've noticed is like, the guests they have tots. 
like they have little tarts that they they tell you and um like they will mention stuff by name and i'm very excited to make a planet zoo video because you see some of the hilarious things that they'd say i don't know mate i'm sure it's been done before like i can't be the only one that played this game and was like oh look at what it can do but i'm still gonna show you around my zoo another thing planet zoo incentivizes is uh Right, because if you have like a vending machine, it will rate your vending machine higher, which I assume um like gives you bonuses, like makes more people use it based on the scenery around it. So it incentivized me to put loads of scenery around my vending machine, and like it just looks extremely extra because of that um and i just started doing loads of weird stuff with it putting in loads of curse words you know because they let you do that they have like little letters and you can change the number the color of them as well so you can make a little prize pride flag out of them um it lets you do that and that's exactly what I decided to do because it lets you and it wants you to. I My zoo's a bit weird because of that. And there's at least one thing I've done that's probably not dev intended, but you can still do it. I'll talk about that in the Planet Zoo video itself if I make it. But I just want to say on, on the note, it's a great game. I love it. You should buy it if you like animals at all. And you like the kind of zoo tycoon sort of games. You will love that game. It's great. They've also released Binturongs. Which I've I've become a bit of a Binturong aficionado. Like I've always thought they were cool. But now I'm thinking of doing an entire episode about just Binturongs. Because there's just been two wrongs. Uh, because uh, they're just lovely. They're just. There's such a lovely little fella form. And I've been thinking lately, like... Another thing I've been thinking about that is really, like, relevant to art and the kind of art that I do is, like, how much of this can I show my family? Because I want to show my family some of the stuff I do. I'd never want them... I'd never want them to see my deviant art. Like, that's very private to me, but most of the stuff like like 80 percent i say of the stuff i do i'd love to show them because my family have always been really supportive with my art from day one i'd just love to show them some of the work i've been doing and i kind of do like i put it up on facebook um maybe i should try putting some of my music on facebook as well but i'm always scared they're gonna like like my family aren't like this i know they wouldn't do this but you know, I've had at least one ex-friend look up, um, find my DeviantArt true, um, reverse image search. I'm scared that someone's gonna reverse image search and find stuff. You know, here's something that I always say about this, like, if you find, like, freaking piss art that I've made, it's your fault. You looked for that. It's your fault. You look to see if it was there, and it was. Great. Your fault. <laughs> That's something I've I've always said. Like, so I probably shouldn't feel bad about that if someone does that. But at the same time, it's like I don't. I don't want that. Like, how much of this is it okay to show them before they start getting a bit curious and sniffing around places that they they probably shouldn't. Like, any other artists that make art like, like I do, where it's like, some of it is like family friendly and some of it isn't. What do I do? Can, can I show them my art and feel happy about that? Like, what do I do if my art, like, this is not something I have to worry about, but what if it gets more popular and they see what kind of weird stuff I do? Like, like, what, how do people cope with, with that? Like, with having stuff that's very much something 
that's a part of them and they're not really ashamed of it but at the same time they don't really t- want to talk to their family about it like how do how do people deal with that like how do like freaking porn stars and all that stuff like if don't want to talk to their family about it like but they're still proud of the work they like there is some stuff I want to show my family I'll probably just put it on Facebook and leave it at that and you know just not worry about it but it's like I was just wondering how other people cope with this is there a way to cope with this is there an equity I'm not good at pronouncing some words and you'll have to deal with that but is there something in particular I should be doing because I if there is I don't know it at all So I love art. Art is a part of my life and my family, they know that, so. Hmm. I really like how this fella's turning out. He's, um, he looks a lot more, um, detailed than the art average drawn I do, which is really nice, because I want to, I really want to kind of branch out and, like, make my style more versatile and more because a few things like don't work in my style very well and like i think this kind of style that i'm going with here like this could be an evolution and it could be really nice um So let's see what what else I want to talk about after I do this bit because you know I'm not I've not drawn facial hair quite like this before so I'm hoping this turns out as good as I want it to turn out and it looks good this hat looks silly all right I'm going to talk about Crazy Frog now. Um, and for this section, I'm going to stop drawing it. Because my boyfriend did this for, for me last night. He he read... This is what he did for me last night. He read the controversy page of the Crazy Frog Wikipedia. And content warning for this next section. This next section, there's going to be talking about crazy frogs um bits and obviously the fucking name crazy frog that could be even triggering to some people like or even just crazy frog in general like i'm gonna i'm gonna read this out and i'm gonna talk a little bit about my own personal experience with crazy frog but this bit right here the reason you're not seeing any drawn is because i'm purely talking this is talking like there's no draw and it's just it's just talk um so here i go in february 2005 viewers submitted a number of complaints to the united kingdom advertising standards authority asa regarding jamsters advertising campaign complaining that crazy frog appeared to have a visible penis and scrotum some parents complained that this made inappropriate viewing for children. There were also complaints regarding the frequency with which the advertisement appeared on television, reportedly up to twice an hour across most of the day, with some channels showing it more than once per commercial break. The ASA did not uphold the complaints, pointing out that the advert was already classified as inappropriate for Erin during children's television programmes as it contained a premium rate telephone number. It was the broadcaster's decision how often an advertisement should be shown. Jamster voluntarily censored the character's genital area via pixelisation in later broadcasts of its advertisements. 
Similar action occurred in Australia with similar results. In 2005, television viewers complained about misleading advertisements produced by Jamba, trading as Jamster and Ringtone King. So that's what they were saying that they were. Um, viewers felt that it was not made sufficiently clear that they were subscribing to a service rather than paying a one-time fee for their ringtone. The complaints were upheld. See, I think that's really funny that they're kind of ahead of the curve in a way. You know, making having the Crazy Frog ringtone a service. <laughs> And making it nowhere clear that's what's happening. The same way, like, I don't know, you pay for a month of Amazon Prime and then they they charge you again, like... And you don't, like, get any say in that. You have to cancel it yourself. Stuff like that. and Free-to-play games and all that. Ahead of the curve in terms of scumminess. In May 2005... Viewers inundated the ASA with new complaints regarding the continuous airing of the latest Crazy Frog advertisements. The intensity of the advertising was unprecedented in British television history. According to The Garden, Jamster bought 73 and 716 thousand spots across all TV channels in May alone an average of nearly 2,378 slots daily at a cost of about 8 million, just under half of which was spent on high TV. 87% of the population saw the Crazy Frog adverts, an average of 26 times. 15% <laughs> of the adverts appeared twice during the same advertising break, and 66% were in consecutive breaks. An estimated 10% of the population saw the advert more than 60 times. This led to many members of the population finding the Crazy Frog, as its original name suggests, immensely irritating. I mean, that's where he probably gets the name, the annoying thing. And this isn't the United Kingdom, but over in Ireland, um, we kind of watch British TV a lot as well. Like, we have our own TV stations, but we also get a lot of British programmes a lot of British TV stations as well, especially if you had Sky or something like that. But some of us might have dodged as much Crazy Frog as... Like, not as much Crazy Frog as the Brits, which I feel like many Irish people are probably thankful for. As the authority had already adjudicated on the matter and confirmed that the matter was not within its remit... The unusual step was taken of adding a notice to the ASAA's online telephone complaint system informing viewers that Jamster related complaints should be directed towards the broadcaster or the regulator, Ofcom. So there's a citation needed on that bit, so like, we don't, we don't bleed and know if that's real, but I think it's very funny that they're like, Crazy Frog isn't, isn't our freaking place anymore, go somewhere else. Can't cope with him anymore. Can't cope with Crazy Frog. I mean, I mean, who could? Who could? On 21st of September 2005, the ASA ruled that the Crazy Frog, along with other Jamba ringtone advertisements, should not be shown before 9pm. This adjudication was revised on the 21st of January 2006, maintaining the upheld decision, but revising the wording of one of the points. Now, there's a bit here about crazy, like a virus that um, spread through MSN, showing um, crazy frog dying. And then, apparently, on July 1st, 2020, the crazy frog Twitter account posted a depiction of the character in a noose appearing to commit suicide by hanging. The tweet was quickly deleted and an apology was issued. The apology itself has been deleted as well. So, like, I never knew that happened until yesterday. And 
I just like they deleted that they want no one to know I really think that was probably for publicity that because if you look at the the apology tweet they're like oh mel- multiple people have this account and that person was dealt with but it's like you know that could happen but you know I feel like you're you're doing it for the the publicity anyways I hope you enjoyed that interlude of crazy frog shenanigans um I might actually overlay like words like the words from the article itself because um like for people that are actually watching me draw like they might not find that as entertaining like the small minority of viewers aka none actually watching the drawing um because it's, this is basically a podcast with optional vid- visuals. Um, but I'm going to tell you a bit about my own personal history with Crazy Frog. I actually created a YouTube video. I, I think it's still up. That got one million views. Um, the video was called... I believe it was called Crazy Cow versus Crazy Frog and the cow was another one of these characters that was like a viral video character like a viral video ringtone sort of character that was equally if not more annoying than Crazy Frog and I found, I don't know if this was actually made by the Crazy Frog people, it might have been. I think it might be an official Crazy Frog song. I, I don't know. But um, it was like, this version of the song Popcorn with Crazy Frog in it. And um, there is a bit in it where, where the cow, like, beats up crazy frog and gets him to stop being annoying or whatever um in it it's all audio though so i was like my child brain was like i will provide um visuals i provide visuals of 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 the cow destroying crazy frog so i opened Windows Movie Maker. Like downloaded the original Crazy Frog thing. I downloaded the cow going I like the moo moo or whatever it was. Um I plopped them in Windows Movie Maker and when the cow was talking the cow would be on screen. And when Crazy Frog was talking, Crazy Frog would be on screen. And then when the sound effect of the cow killing Crazy Frog played, I I played the bit in the original advert where Crazy Frog is off the screen. And you only see the, um, the gas from his invisible motorbike, um, there. And it took me like five minutes and I got a million views, a million YouTube views off five minutes of work. And like, this has happened to me many times actually, like not many times, it happened to me at least twice. Um, Where I'd post something on the internet that I put like five minutes of work into and it goes viral. And it's always the five minutes of work. It's never anything more than that. The 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 second thing that I did that went viral is um, I think I put a bit more effort into this one. This was in in the Tumblr days. So, um, I used to love um, one of my favorite shows on the telly used to be Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide. 
um i just really liked it i don't know what it was i think it was relatable like it was relatable you know it was about school um there was a meme on tumblr at the time where you'd have um like it would be a subtitle you can put on anything and the subtitle would be blogging loudly that would be the subtitle and, and somebody made a transparent thing that you could put on anything and i was like it'd be so i have this gif of of cookie really happy on his on his on his laptop like this would be perfect for for him to be blogging loudly so I went and I did that. I went into now the name of this program is bad. Um, it's a slur, and I hope they change it. But I went into to GIMP, and I went the extra mile because I made sure I basically I made a GIF. Like it wasn't just a static image. I made a GIF, which probably contributed to the final post success i imported the gif the the, the the gif that would become the blog and loudly gif and on every frame i put in the blog and loudly which is just cookie from ned's declassified school survival guide on his laptop looking happy it's only a couple frames not a couple a few a couple means two it was more than two it was only a few frames but it like it was a slow burn like it got it got a few reblogs and likes at the start and then it just took off and i think it stabilized at around half a million notes which is pretty decent for Tumblr. And I was just inundated with notes. Um, my timeline was just inundated with notes about this. And I'm really like, I was just really happy to have this happen to me twice, you know? Like something goes viral and it's like, it's very funny. Like the content that I seem to make, like, it doesn't have virality to it, but every now and then you get something that's a lightning in a bottle. And it's always something you don't expect anyone to care about. It's always like, if you make something, very rare in this world, you make something. And you're like, oh, I'm happy with that. I, I'd say loads of people would like that. And loads of people actually like it. It's usually some crap that you just churn out and you're like, oh, that's kind of funny. And then it just goes viral and it takes off. I mean, this happens, this happens so much, like, Radiohead's Creep, for example, like, I'm sure they actually put a lot of work into Creep, but, like, they hate it now. They hate the thing that, like, really made their band took off, take off. Well, I think they're actually starting to come around on Creep, I think they started playing it again. But, that happens a lot, so if you're an artist, keep in mind that, like, Anything you post, anything you put in the public eye could become your your radio head creep, could become your your cookie blogging loudly, could become your crazy cow versus crazy frog. So make sure you believe in it fully. Everything you put online and I know it's a lot of pressure, but it's also kind of inspiring that, you know, something that you didn't really think about could have that virality to it. And it usually it is like as history has shown us, it usually is the thing that you don't think could ever take off that takes off. But I love that. It makes me it makes me very happy to be doing draw and talk. Like maybe it's cursed. Like if I say like, oh, what if this is the episode that gets the the crazy cow versus crazy frog treatment? Maybe that kind of jinxes it a little bit um but 
It's an interesting phenomenon. I want to know if there's a name for this phenomenon, or is this... Because if there isn't a name, I'd like to, um... I'd like to call it, um, the Eris Principle, thank you very much. Or the Terry Principle. You, you pick whichever one you like. And the principle states that whenever you make something, something goes viral, it's always something that you don't expect. I'm sure someone could put that more eloquently than me, but there you go. Is there anything else I can talk about with Crazy Frog? I don't think so, like, I think I've said everything I really can say about him. I think it's strange that he's still relevant. Maybe not relevant, but, like, he's he's on Twitter in, in 2020, like... I, like, he came back during COVID, like, that's a bit... I don't know how to feel about that. How do you feel about that? I don't know how people feel about that. Um... I do. Um, another thing to say about Crazy Frog is that Mr. Mr. Peng Perngosten is of the opinion that, of the fan theory that is heavily supported by the canon, that Crazy Frog's motorbike is actually him farting and he has tried to replicate it multiple times to no success. So there you go, a bit more of Mr. Perengo Stan lore, because that's great. I wanna, I wanna tie in everything I've talked about in a nice little bundle. Also, this episode is one of those episodes like, because I tried last week. Um, I made a very tight episode last week that was just under an hour long, and I talked about everything I wanted. Then I went and I finished the drawing by myself. I'm gonna, I think I'll do the opposite this episode, where, um, I just keep talking until the drawing's done, like the pilot episode with, um, Crash, Crash Bandicoot, which I think is of similar zaniness to this episode, because I talk about, like, some heavy stuff with, in front of Crash Bandicoot, and it's like, now I'm talking about heavy stuff in front of Mr. Perngosten. Let's have a look, see. I was gonna talk about original characters. Uh, I was gonna talk about OCs. Because Mr. Mr. Perngo, Perngoston, it's the first OC I've made in a while. And I made them pretty much the same way I used to make OCs all the time. I was like, oh, it would be fun to draw. I love that. I think that's a sign. It is a sign that I'm healing. To me, to me it's a sign of that because... It is hard to make OCs for me, when I'm depressed, um, because it's hard to, to put yourself, to make an entirely different person when you're sad, all you can think about is, oh, me, 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 um, I'm sad, I'm this, I'm bad, so I drew a lot of, I drew a lot of coping art, and a lot of that coping art was basically just me and Kyle. You know, some of it was self hatey some of it was, um, trying to be empowering, some of it was silly, um, but I wouldn't draw OCs as much. The only time I'd really draw an OC is someone else's OC. I just couldn't make my own OCs. I didn't want to 
couldn't come up with any good ideas, but now I've come up with this. This fart C. McGee. And I mean, I see a bit of myself in him, I will be honest, but... Like, not that much. Like, he is not me. I'm not a person that's obsessed with farts, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> I'm not a strange imp, but... You know, it's a little bit of expressing myself still because it's like, I want to draw this absolutely mad yoke. I want to draw him. And I do draw him. It's awesome. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the kind of OCs I'd come up with before I got really sad. Really dysphoric and really sad. Because I was always really dysphoric, but I always found I always found ways kind of around it when I was younger. Around addressing the root cause. And I will in another draw and talk episode I'll talk about that. It's very it's quite a personal story of how I realised I was trans, I have gender dysphoria and I need to to deal with it. I, need, I can't run from myself anymore. I need to deal with it. That's for a different episode. But I used to love making OCs. I've made them since I was very young. And I used to draw a lot of cat OCs. And these would be like cartoon anthropomorphic cats. And I think I've said this before but... I think I said this on a different episode, but I was basically like a furry before I knew what a furry was. Drew a lot of cats, anthropomorphic cats, and they would... Now, this is where I got from. Uh, there's this show called Recess. It's a cartoon. Um, it's a lovely cartoon, one of my favourite cartoons, and you should absolutely watch it. I have lots of great memories of Recess, particularly, because it was always the one show me and my sister would watch together. Like, she didn't really like all the cartoons that I liked, but we could both watch Recess together, and that was nice. Because me and my sister, we fought a lot. Um, she was quite an aggressive person when she was younger. And we had a lot of fights and recess was the one time I could actually relax and I liked recess, she liked recess and we both liked recess. We didn't have to fight over who has the telly, we could just both watch recess. Love that about recess, but in recess in recess they had like there was like different characters in recess and they'd be called like Corn Ship Girl was one of them. They'd have like names like that. Like it'd be like this kid, like or Corn Ship Girl. Or let me look up because I all I can think of is Corn Ship Girl right now. Recess characters. So. Hustler Kid was one of them. Um, Corn Ship Girl. Frickin' Menlo. God. Nostalgia. I love the show. Library Kid. And then they'd have, like, the AV Kid. All stuff like that. So it would be Someone Kids. It was a big trope in the show. So I would, I think that's where I got the inspiration from, because I'd be like, it's this type of cat. Like, I'd be like, supersonic cat. Um, pink cat. ABC cat. ABC cat was a big one. And I think it's really funny, and I think it says a lot about the time I grew up in, and the, the way we treat kids, that that um why why abc cat is called that 
because I was I think I had a bit of a fascination because I was I was like an older kid and I was an older kid but I really like had a weird fascination with um the sort of weird sort of educationalness of stuff that was aimed at younger children I really loved reader rabbit Reader Rabbit is this is this PC game that I think Reader Rabbit really influenced me as a person now I think about it. I think Reader Rabbit got me into animation. Like there was this animation mini game in one of them. Um But I was fascinated and like it was all it was always about like oh learn your numbers, learn your ABCs learn learn this all oh, your colors and that's where abc cat came from it's like this is the cat that teaches you the fundamentals the abcs that's how powerful this cat is it's a lot of it's a lot of tropes that i mash together that I saw as a kid, the recess tropes, the kind of stuff aimed at younger children sort of tropes. And then like anthropomorphic animals, cause like I wasn't a furry. Well, I was a furry, but like, I didn't know what that means. So I didn't know I was a furry. I got that from telly. I got that from, you know, seeing anthropomorphic cats on the TV. Which isn't as popular these days, I don't think. I don't think you see that many shows like that anymore. Probably because they're worried, like, this furry thing is, like, a lot more viral now. They're kind of worried of being like, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to come off like we're catering to furries. But it's like, kids like antro animals, like Tom and Jerry, stuff like that is what would influence me. So I kind of mashed them all together to create my own little world. And I took I took the little world that I created very seriously. I mean, ABC Cat was originally like, oh, th this cat will teach you your ABCs. But it turned into something, something very different very quickly. Because quickly, I my fascination with, oh, this cat will teach you the ABCs, that, that wore off quickly. I got in science fiction i was thinking of ratchet and clank um mostly and like ben 10 um another kind of older kid stuff i would be thinking of um so quickly it went from you know oh this is a this is a shock because I'll be honest, like, I don't know if this is weird, but when I was, this is probably some autistic thing, but when I was a kid, I pretended I was on TV constantly. I'd be like, this is this show. This is the show where ABC Cat is like, you know, killing the evil bad guys. This is the show where, um, like, I'd get I'd get focused on some dominoes or dice and the patterns in them and I'd focus on that for like an hour and I'd be like this this is being broadcast somewhere people are seeing what I'm doing with these dominoes and how I'm illustrating illustrating these dominoes and talking about what's going on with them um which is probably why draw and talk is very good for me because it's like whatever it's just something i normally do but it's suddenly a show just a normal thing that becomes a show it's just a good outlet for that like the outlet i had as a child now having that as an adult and also having an oc it's like it's lovely like you, you make an adult a version of what preoccupied you as a child as an adult in a healthy adult sort of way 
Not that you can't also enjoy it in a childish way, because you can, but you can also have an adult version and it can be appropriate as an adult and it can be valid as an adult. So I do that and so my the lore I'm gonna tell you about the ABC cat lore, right? They were now the lore's changed over the years, and as I've gotten older, I've kind of fleshed it out a bit more. So, I I'm just gonna go with what I feel like is in my head right now about it. So ABC Cat is like ABC Cat is always always like like the protagonist, and over time, like when I was a teenager, I started calling ABC Cat Alphabet because or alpha or abacus stuff like that because um i was like abc that's kind of that's kind of cringy whatever but abc cat as we're gonna call him he's always like abc cat's gender was also always in flux because abc cat was sometimes myself insert sometimes not sometimes abc cat was a she sometimes a her I never really settled on what the gender of ABC cat was never like I still don't know the gender of ABC cat um, it's just whatever I was feeling at the time like it didn't matter to me as a kid I was like oh whatever like it's, it's a cat that's the gender um, So, I think I'll use he pronouns for ABC Cat because the latest iteration that I did of ABC Cat as a teenager was a he, but like throughout my childhood, ABC Cat would be a she sometimes, sometimes a he, some probably a day before I even knew about they them pronouns to be honest, but I'll go with he because that's the iteration that I'm most familiar with. So, ABC Cat, the lore is that humans, like, I think this is the heat that, not the heat that of the universe, but the sun exploding. Or, no, no, not the sun exploding, the sun gets big and it consumes Earth. And it and other planets become more temperate because the sun is getting big. And humans for whatever reason I think humans uh they take cats and dogs and other animals and they put them on the the dwarf planet the the pluton known as eris which is interesting because that is that is like the name that i like to call myself um these days i wasn't really thinking of that but i was just thinking i liked how it sounded but that the planet eris was always um because i also was like obsessed with space it was a new special interest as a kid still is just not as intense um right so you like they they left the cats and the dogs on eris and then they went off somewhere else and over the thousands and millions of years billions of years the cats and dogs they they like um evolved they evolved and they became intelligent they became intelligent beings with their own technology and they became anthropomorphic cats and that so that's supposed to explain away like i don't know most universes don't explain that kind of thing but i was I was thinking that's a big part of it because it's sci-fi um so that is why 
That's why there's cats on planet Eris. And the dogs were more often than not the evil characters. I think I saw this as subversive because I grew up with um, cats versus dogs. You know, the cats are always the evil ones. Well, in my story, the dogs were always the evil ones. But not always. Like, they, they, were, they were good dogs as well. It's not like I hated dogs or anything. I think I was just trying to subvert the trope a bit. Because I was a cat lover and it upset me that they always got a bad rap. And I, and I talked about this in the cat episode that you won't, you're not getting to see. But like I was teased a lot as a kid for liking cats so I probably found some sort of comfort in that. Gotta do another cat episode to be honest. Like once the hot takes have cooled down like. They're on cooldown and they need to get hot again. Um, right, so you'd have you'd have these these cats, these dogs. The dogs would mostly because they've made like an evil hideout on Disomnia. No, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's one of that's one of Eris's moons. So they'd be on the moon. So, and the planet that the cats are on is called Cat World. And the planet that the dogs are on is called Dog Moon. And it's not, it's not like perfect. Like there's some dogs on Cat World. There's some cats on Dog Moon. And the dogs have like this oppressive regime that they have going. Um. An ABC cat is like he's got he's got his like gun. He's gonna go and take him out, basically. Whatever, it's quite simple. That part is quite simple. I thought of all the setup and then why they're actually fighting, I never really thought about that. It's a good thing there's a lot to talk about here, because, gosh, I'm going to be drawing Mr. Prango Stan for a good while, yeah, aren't I? So you'd have, you'd have ABC Cat and all that. And I draw comics, I draw pictures of ABC Cat and friends. I'd also roleplay ABC Cat. Um, with my cousins mainly because um, I was very close to my cousins when I was younger so we'd role play ABC cat stuff together and I love how like in retrospect I love how certain they were of this that I had this world in my head and that we would just role play it together we'd play all these all these different type of games um, and they were great for on they were kind of like LARPing before LARPing would be a thing and there's no outfits and i'd be kind of like a dungeon master almost because what we do is we'd be out like in a garden or somewhere and there would be like designated areas for all these different cats to be so like abc cat would be somewhere also like <laughs> abc cat was always like like i haven't i haven't played Oh, okay, someone's beeping. I haven't played uh, Final Fantasy, but... Shit, let me look this up. I haven't played it, but I watched a video about it. And ABC Cat would take on, similar to the lights of Sephiroth, and that, like... He never like shows up in person. He's always like, he's always on like a holographic call with you. And like my cousin, my one cousin that was, I was like really close to like, he, he really like appreciated the grandiosity of ABC Cat. Be like, he'd be like, oh, such an honor ABC <laughs> Cat. 
lovely. Um, see how Mr. Pango's then is going. <clears throat> I should do his facial hair next. Um, so most there would like always be like an elder cat. Like I see, I only really remember ABC cat. Like my memory's really foggy about this. Um, because it was so long ago, but, um, there'd be always, like, an elder cat, there would always be, like, evil cats, there, there were these evil dogs that were just called Woof Woof, there was this evil dog that we came up with one day called Woof Woof, actually, I don't, I don't like the way this facial hair is coming out, I think I'm gonna try something else. There was this evil dog called Woof Woof and like there was an eviler dog called Woof 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 then there was an even eviler dog called Woof 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 Oh my god this is this reminded me of something really embarrassing but it's going to be really funny to talk about <laughs> <laughs> I think one one time we had um one that was like Woof a million and like my cousin I really appreciated him. He he treated it with the, the grandiosity that Wolf a Million deserves. But I remember once I was in I think it was fourth class, might have been third class, um I don't know. But Right, so you do a creative writing sort of assignment and teacher would like pick out like one or two that he thinks would be interesting to read to the class this is something that would happen a lot and uh, I was delighted because one day he chose mine and I took I tended to take the creative writing stuff quite seriously I should do a readout because I have some of writing that I did from that time saved and it's like it's lovely it's cringy it's funny it's great I'd love to read it out um but like I'd experiment a lot with how I wanted these cats to be because they would normally be anthropomorphic cats like ABC cat but I had like several different you know inklings on how how what best describes these cats that I'm trying to to get people interested in and occasionally I'd be like okay well I do it warrior cat style now I didn't read warrior cats as a kid I mean I, I'm sure if I did I would have gotten really into it but I, this one was warrior cat style kind of I don't remember what the story was about, but I do remember like I I wrote out phonetically because the cats were meowing to each other, and then I'd write afterwards what the what what I meant. So I would like write something like this, like or whatever, you know. So. <laughs> The teacher, like, because this is how I, I would have, like, so, like, something like that. You go, morale, or whatever. It's, but the teacher, like, when he was reading this stuff out, he went, he he really went, got into it. <laughs> he, and he went, I don't, he very loud meows like maybe he was waiting for this for this moment maybe that's why he chose my story he was like this is such a great opportunity to make realistic hammed up cat noises in front of the class and he did it he hammed up the cat noises so much and it was it was quite embarrassing for me at the time like I was embarrassed I thought it was funny like everyone else but I was just I was really embarrassed I never wrote something like that again. I just didn't 
expect that at all. It was such an embarrassing experience. So a lot of my original characters were cats and dogs and we w I wouldn't just draw pictures of them. I expressed I expressed them by pretending to be them, by role playing them with friends, my cousins, um writing and thinking up lore about them. You know, it was multidisciplinary. Um So that's what those characters would have been like and that's what really made me love drawing. It was such a great way for me to express those characters that I had in my head. Then as I got older, um you know, I taught because because of that, because of like coming up with all these stories, I taught like that must mean Deep down, I really want to be a storyteller. So I started writing stories. I started getting interested in animation and comics and all these other ways you tell stories with art. I was very interested in that and I thought, like, oh, this is a great fit for me. And maybe it is in some respects, but I came up with this comic and you can read it if you want maybe i'll put a link in the description if i remember um it's not finished i managed to make the first chapter of it um it was called Frambot. and i i came up with it when i was a teenager and the best parts of Frembot, like, because I'm not a writer, the best parts of Frembot were actually came up by my uh, boyfriend because, um, even though, even when I, like, stopped being a teenager, I was like, I really want to, my teenage self was really obsessed with making this comic, I want to make it a reality. And so I tried my best to, and... You know, it just didn't work out in the end, and that's okay. But, and I'm, I'm very thankful for, for the time I had with Frembot. Frembot was fun, it was fun to work on. Um, came up with some characters that I still enjoy thinking about to this day. It's, 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 it's a love story. It has sci-fi elements. Because I, I love putting sci-fi elements in things. Um, it's about artificial intelligence. It's about this this girl falls in love with a robot, and it's this big lesbian sort of love story. There's a lot of queer themes in it. A lot of queer themes. There's non-binary characters, gay characters, stuff like that in it. Trans characters. Um, Because I kind of put like whatever gender feels, whatever ways I was exploring my gender and stuff into Frembot a little bit. And I really enjoyed Frembot. Lucy, one of the titular characters, was very fun to draw. And I'm thinking I might draw her again sometime. Maybe I'll do a whole episode about Frembot. Um... Well, original characters, I think original characters are great. I think they're really good. And I think we should, I really think you should like just encourage art no matter how cringy it is. Because like these cringy things I did as a child and as a tween and a teenager even, like I love thinking about them. Like I am, I do get a bit embarrassed thinking about them sometimes, but I also, like they filled my life with, with such joy and happiness. And I was really happy that I did them in the end. Like I have these 
these cringy blogs that I love watching with my boyfriend and kind of having a laugh at myself because they're so cringy like cringe is kind of a good thing cringe is like so human and I kind of like you know some people seek out cringe content and I don't I can't speak for why they do it but I know whenever I'm seeking out cringe content I I look I like how how just human it is I don't know what it is but stuff that like kind of makes you cringe like or at least makes other people cringe like it doesn't always make me cringe I think other people are like they kind of cringe cuz they're like I don't know maybe like maybe they're like I I kind of want to do that and I see why they do that but you know you shouldn't do that because of these societal conventions or cuz they're ignorant about something specific I don't know what the exact recipe for cringe is like stuff that like it changes as you get older like we we I feel like we're most susceptible to cringe of stuff we're most susceptible to cringe of stuff we used to do. Because, like, I remember, like, Tumblr. Tumblr had this nude change in culture. How else, like, between Dashcon and, like, like, 2012 Tumblr and 2015 Tumblr, totally different places. One is a cringe hole and the other isn't. I... Th- like, did the user base just change overnight? I don't think that it... That's it. Like, this is speculation. But I think... I think people started growing up a little bit. And they started looking at their past selves. And thinking, oh man, why did I do that? I don't understand why I did that anymore. Because I'm older now. I'm more mature. And, like... I wouldn't do that. Like, especially, like, the Homestuck fandom. One, one, one thing that people might find cringy is, like, like somebody cosplaying a Homestuck troll and the Homestuck person doesn't really... Like, it's their first cosplay. They don't understand that they have to seal the paint and the paint gets... The grey paint gets everywhere. That's, like, peak cringe. And, like someone might have done that they might have like gotten they might have cosplayed a homestuck troll gotten gray paint everywhere and now everybody's making fun of people that get gray paint everywhere and it's like you have cringe because you realize oh i made a mistake i'm cringing at that i'm cringing at this person because they're making the same mistake i made that i feel embarrassed about but there's another way to say it, and it's also like, it's so human, it's like, I understand exactly, I both understand exactly why someone would cosplay a Homestuck troll and not seal the paint because of their ignorance, and I also totally understand why they should seal their paint. I, at the same time, I understand why someone is doing something why someone is acting cringy and I understand why they shouldn't why it's in their best interest to not it's a weird sort of empathy it's like a double whammy of empathy at least that's how I I feel it like it's different for everyone I'm sure but I feel like that's a little bit of what cringe content is and can be I think it's it's possible to feel cringe like in situations where you maybe don't empathize with the person. Perhaps I'm not but I'm not really sure what psychological processes go into that. Oh, look at him, he's done. I think he's done. Is there anything else? I think he's done. Look at him this fuzzy guy he's so fuzzy this is the interesting part because i think i'm gonna talk more about the art here because 
I don't know what colours he is. I haven't coloured him in before. I've only done little uh, sketches of him. So I'm excited to design what kind of colours this lad's going to be. But that's cringe and like if our sees are cringe that's good i think a little bit of cringe and our cringe response in general can be a good thing and you know i don't think we should look at it like oh you should never you should never do something cringe because like i was one of those people i put everything online i put all of my most of my cringe online as soon as i could like people like people are getting online younger and younger but i was like putting loads of cringe online and you know people these days are kind of like oh you shouldn't do that like everyone like when you're older people can look back and they can they can see you being cringe and you know that that'll make people not like you or whatever I love that I can look back on that. I can love that I can kind of cringe at my past self and and think I've come a long way. I'm different now. I've grown. I'm grown and it's cute and it's quaint to look back at a me that wasn't as informed, wasn't as mature and i'm sure like me 20 years from now is probably looking at this and being like oh what a twat isn't he funny didn't know anything back then and that's beautiful that's like you should be growing it should should like seeing your growth and i think the the real problem with it is not like that i think the real problem is other people going and looking and finding that cringe and like exploiting it in some way and people do do that people can be nasty i mean that's like what kiwi farms is about farming cringe for for lulls for entertainment instead of like having sort of a nuanced look at what a person is doing they just They just, um, they exploit it. They exploit it to be mean and cruel. And oftentimes, um, forward a certain agenda, you know? That's, that's not on. And I think in this world where we have, like, anyone that goes online has a permanent record of, like, unless, unless they, unless they, like, because I know people like this. There's like people who are real into their privacy, real into um, deleting stuff and having it be deleted. But there's also so much beauty in it not being deleted. There's so much beauty in it being there. Maybe we as a society, like, obviously, like, delete your stuff if you want to, it's fine. But for people that didn't think to delete them or didn't want to delete them or wanted them to be there we shouldn't shame that and we shouldn't punish that and we shouldn't we as a society should make it not acceptable to punish that and judge someone off of stuff that they did maybe 10 years ago stuff that they put on twitter 10 years ago stuff that they put on tumblr 10 years ago or websites that might not have any relevance anymore like meta cafe that's where a lot of my cringe went wetpaint.com pixo bebo myspace we shouldn't shame that because if we're gonna live in this society this digital society we gotta we gotta have that that sense that it's not okay to go back look at someone's past and then judge them about it judge their cringe instead of embracing the cringe is just a natural part of being human that we used to see sometimes but now we see all the time because we have the internet 
the internet allows us to see anyone's cringe anytime anyone's frick up anyone's mess up anytime it can't be acceptable to judge harass or discriminate someone based on cringe now if they're if they're still doing it like that's different if, like i mean if they're still being cringy like that's that's fine but like if they're doing something that's cringy specifically because it's harmful like saying something transphobic because you know often before someone comes out like they're gonna be internalized transphobia internalized homophobia and i was one of those like you could go back on my tumblr like i was always i was always definitely leftist but i didn't have the terminology i wasn't perfectly educated i said i said some things that people on twitter would cancel me for if they went back and they looked at that it'd be it'd be twitter cancelable content Because I just didn't know any better. And I know better now. So yeah, that's my hot take while drawing a fart and imp. We should make it unacceptable to, to judge someone based on their, their past cringes. And, and their present tense cringes, really. Especially if they're harmless. Because, you know, something can be cringy and harmful at the same time. And something can be cringy and not harmful. So, I'm going to dive into talking about Mr. Perngos then now. Um, oh, what's Epic Games doing? Open, close Epic Games. And I'm going to turn off Flux. I don't know if you, you guys can see Flux. If you all can see flux um but i turned that off so i can actually do the colors correctly that's a nice brown um oh but that's a better brown it's a juicy brown let's do the hair i'm thinking i do the hair like a really nice dark sort of brown color really deep brown kind of color I want him to have a bit of red somewhere like I might change the brown to red if this actually that's actually okay I'm just gonna do the hair first I'm very happy with how he's turning out like I just love love how it's turning out so much sometimes I do draw on and I don't want to shade it in I'm gonna want to shade this one in Um, also, I was thinking, um, one of my friends expressed interest in being on the show, and I'm really excited if we can coordinate it. I was thinking of having her on, uh, next week, next Friday, for next Friday. I think she wanted to talk about, uh, Kirby law because apparently Kirby has incredible lore that no one talks about or maybe people do talk about it I don't but at least like I don't know anything about Kirby which is interesting because like will will it be interesting or to hear me react to the Kirby lore be simply because I don't know anything about Kirby. Will that like add to the interest for people? Because I hope it does, you know? You know, I can't contribute to the conversation meaningfully. I'm not a Kirby fan. Well, I'm sure I would like Kirby. I just, you know, I didn't really grow up with um, Nintendo consoles as much. I had, had a DS, I had a Game Boy, but I didn't have like n64 or anything like that so i kind of missed out a bit on kirby there 
I'm really, I really like the way I went with the, the facial hair here, because it's like, it's just kind of pointing out of him, accentuating the pointiness. He's a little imp. He's a devious little imp, and we just, we just know that just by looking at him. Gosh. Hmm, I still should see brown. I want to see how it looks, how he looks in red. I think that's way too saturated. Um. Ooh, now he's having some Saiyan vibes. Oh, turn that off. Turn, turn, turn. Okay, I don't know if you, you saw that, but I accidentally turned on precision mode. He's having some Saiyan vibes. I think we will keep him with the Saiyan vibes, to be honest. Because that's what I'm going for. He's like a little devil. He's got the little devil thing. That reminds me of something I wanted to talk about on the show as well. Um, should I talk about it or save it for a different time? Just the whole, the whole idea of Satanism. Satanism and Satan and edgy Satan imagery is very comforting to me. It's very, like, it's comfortable to me. There's nothing about, oh shit, is this all on the same like Anyways. See, look, I did a bit of, I did a cringe. Um. In fact, what I'm talking about might be a bit cringe. Um, let's carry on. Um, Satanism and all that, like Satan stuff, pentagrams, Baphomet. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. That's comforting to me. There's nothing about it that makes me uncomfortable. And I grew up like Catholic and all that, but there's nothing about satanism that makes me uncomfortable at all like obviously there's like some awful people out there that news that as an excuse to commit atrocities same way anyone has news any sort of religion any sort of ideology as an excuse to murder or hurt someone same as that I wouldn't say that's a uniquely, like, sort of Satan thing. I mean, Satan is, like, seen as the, like, the new evil thing. And I think that's why, like, LGBTQ people, some, some of us, like, identify with, like, these demons and these devils and whatever. Because I certainly do. I like, you know, these demons, these devils satanism hell satan whatever all that like it makes some people very uncomfortable you know that's okay you know people can't help what makes them feel uncomfortable and the reason why that brings comfort to me is that i especially when i was really depressed like i felt uncomfortable all the time i felt uncomfortable seeing people expressing themselves and thinking oh my gosh wish i could do that wish wish i could express my identity that way or somebody doing something that like you know it's it's their identity but it kind of feels invalidating to me i'm gonna give you i'm gonna give an example like let's say a trans man um something that might make a trans man uncomfortable or might make might have made me uncomfortable in the past like a trans man identifying with the d slur and that makes me uncomfortable because it's like that's that's traditionally that's for for lesbians like why would you identify that why why would you say that that makes me really uncomfortable it feels very invalidating to my identity for you to be 
and using that to identify with yourself and using that to say I'm a trans man and I'm also this slur like that makes me really uncomfortable I'm really uncomfortable and sad right now because of you doing that I think people that get really really upset about satanism are kind of the same kind of having the same reaction to me as like that which i don't like i'm not i don't know if i feel that way anymore about i don't feel as uncomfortable thinking about it i don't know even know where i stand on it like i don't know like i don't feel like it's up to me whether or not trans guys get to say that or not i don't i just don't know I mean, I feel very strongly about some things adjacent to this, but not this itself. I'm not, it's like, say it, don't say it. It doesn't really affect me anymore. It's just, but in the past, something like that would have affected me because I didn't feel secure in myself. I felt like any sort of valid validity I might have in my identity could easily be taken away by someone saying, Oh yeah, I identify with this and and that creating sort of an incongruency, creating gender dysphoria even in me. But people, but I realise now people's identities are complicated. Some, like some, the way some trans men might see themselves might be in direct conflict with how I see myself, but that doesn't invalidate me. There is room for both of us to exist as long as they don't go out and start saying hey you're not you're not valid like then that's a problem and I think everyone kind of sees that as a problem as long as they don't start going out and doing that it'll be okay I'll survive I might feel a bit uncomfortable but it's gonna be okay basically so I think some people they see Satanism they see hail Satan and they're like, that's, that makes me really uncomfortable. That's like hurtful towards me and my religion and all that. Not realizing the thing that I have to realize that it doesn't really affect them and that the, they can be valid at the same time. Um, So I took comfort in that. I was like, this makes this makes other people uncomfortable, but I can still identify with it. And like I'm not like I'm not happy that other people are uncomfortable about it necessarily. But it's empowering. Like people saying, Oh like oh you have so much power and sway over my emotions just by saying this thing that is quite inconsequential to you and it it put my own discomfort it puts my own discomfort in perspective it's like when i say oh satanism that's probably what those people that are making me so uncomfortable are feeling when they say those things that make me uncomfortable it's not It's not something they really think about in that way. It's not something to slight me. Hopefully. Like, I'm sure that, that, like, the same way there are Satanists out there. Or, like, people that enjoy the Satan aesthetic that say, Oh, all Christians are bad and evil and should die and whatever. Which, obviously, I, I don't agree with, you know. People can have their religion if they want, as long as they're not hurting other people with it. You know, whatever, like, I like that edgy stuff for that reason. It's not about, it's not necessarily about being edgy. I don't understand, I, I don't know why other people like it. Hopefully, like, not hopefully, but, like, maybe they like it for the same reasons I do. I don't know. If you like, if you like satanic stuff, tell me why you like it. Like, do you genuinely, like, believe in it, maybe? Or, or is it similar to how I feel about it? Or do you just 
Do you just dig the attack? I also dig the attack. It's also quite nice. Of course I do. I'm, I'm finding this, like, sort of satanic imp quite fun to draw. And I'm really digging how this colour palette's coming out. Should I? Hey, I'll put it under here. Should I do this? That's kind of nice. I'll do that. Let's see how how long are we into this? Okay, we're almost at another hour. Um, so I'd say another 30 minutes, maybe, maybe this could go three hours, I don't know, it could, I, I don't think these work for that, this, um, that colour doesn't work as well as I want, I think, like, maybe, not darker, but, like, more saturated, mm, nah, darker, we need darker. Yeah, there we go. That kind of works for it. Um, what about give him yellow eyes? Will yellow eyes work for him? Like, I'll try a few different things. I'll colour it in with this colour that I've been using. And we'll see which one that we like the most. That I like the most. You might like a different one the most, and that's perfectly valid. Like, I'd even give you this, um, this file, and you can edit it to your heart's content, make the perfect colour your own. I, I'll give you the line art, print it out for you, and you can colour in your own Mr, um, Mr. Perngosten. That's totally, like, um, that's so cool, I'd love to see your interpretation. I'd love to see that. Kind of works. How about this? Hmm, that makes them stand out a lot. Hmm. I think we'll go, we'll go with like, because that's already standing out a lot, like. Go with something like. Yeah, I think that's just the right amount, don't you? Because they're kind of glowy eyes. Oh, I forgot to do his fangs. Oh, my God. I could have went this whole video and not done the fangs. Oh, my God. I got to do his fangs. Oh, the shame. The shame. The fangs are such an important part of him. Like, his little biters. He, he looks surprisingly good without them, though. So that's something. Oh yeah, there he is. Now, now he's in. He's now. He's now real. He has reality now. He he feels more fleshed out now. Much more fleshed out now, and I really like that. Um, I was gonna give him yellow teeth for a second, and I do think those would fit in with the color palette. But I'm gonna give him like kind of eggshell teeth because I don't. He's not stinky. Like he is stink, like he makes stinks, but the, they are stinks that he chooses occasionally. Like he actually takes good care of his hygiene. He actually cares about that a lot. Um, do the eyes.
how we do the eyes. Um, I'll put this on a different layer. Do the eyes. Um. Oh, look at that! He's real, guys and gals and then big pals. He's real. Oh, I love seeing this stinky thing that I doodled while watching a Lindsay Alice video come to life. I love making it other people's problem. <laughs> Um, yeah, right. Is there anything else? No, I think that's it. Like, we can start shading them in now. Oh, I'm so scared. I don't want to, I don't want to ruin the shading, like, because I really like the way it's coming. It's coming now. Um, I'm gonna start a new save file. Alright. Starting a new save file which kind of sounds like I'm playing a game uh, but I'm not okay where do we start I think we should start with the um, this bit look at how much how much that adds to him like wow wow right I'm gonna gonna really get in here i'm not gonna i'm not gonna try and be impressive i'm gonna stick with what i know what i know to be true about shading and i'm gonna shade that way it's already quite dark so like most of the volume is gonna come from the highlights Alright, so we're gonna add in the highlights here. Just kinda move it with the motion of the hair. Make it look like it's real. Um, it's very, very subtle highlight so far. Actually, like, I should be... I should shade the rest of it because it's all one layer really before I go in and add the highlights. the gentle part of the video this is the asmr part of the video the part you can fall asleep to oh, by the way i really hope people fall asleep to these that'd be nice you don't have to like you don't obviously you don't have to don't have to do anything um right let's get let's let's do more highlights um I think that's on par with the rest of the shading. Gonna yeah, gonna add some highlights around here. Now the dogs are barking because my ma has gone out so like without her because she takes care of the dogs she's 
treating the dogs so close without her to rein them in they're gonna they're gonna bark there's nothing i can do about that they're just gonna bark i mean i could go down and tell them off but you know they're just that's how they have fun when she's gone you know she isn't there to 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 play with them or pet them or anything you know that's just how it's just how they have fun so even if they do interrupt your own talk with the box just you should feel happy that they're having fun you now let them have fun dogs just want to have fun Right now, these the highlights are getting more intense. I'm gonna Off they go again. Off they go again. <laughs> Borkin. Borkin. They're as much as part of the show as I am. And that's that's good. That's what the show is about. I don't want the show to be about me. <laughs> I really don't. Oh, now that's lovely. That's lovely. It's it's lovely. Just a little bit down there. So it's not shining on this bit as much. Um, maybe a little bit. Did I color that in somewhere else? Cause this isn't showing up. Yeah, I'll do that later. Um. And now, like the highlights, the highlights. This is where stuff gets serious. I love doing this. It's so anime, but I love doing that. It just rounds it out so nicely. That's looking, that's looking nice. Um, quite happy. I think this might be the best drawing I've done on drawing talk so far. At least the one I'm happiest with. Like some people would disagree with me. Like I have these people that follow me on DeviantArt. These two lads, they love pop punk. Um, they one of them commented on my my tom de long drawing today saying it's the best thing i've ever done and i might disagree but i love that to them it's the best thing i've ever done that's lovely um we're gonna do a skin now um That's another thing, like, something, something you're not as happy with could be, like, I kind of ties into what I'm talking about earlier, it's not that important, but, like, it could be someone else's, like, favourite thing. Could be, like, like, 
do something because you believe in it. And it's like, you might believe in it a little bit, but someone else might believe in it a lot. Like, you were like, oh, it'd be good to draw Tom DeLonge. And someone else would be like, it'd be freaking great to draw Tom DeLonge. It'd be amazing. It'd be massive to draw Tom DeLonge. Drawing Tom DeLonge is all you should ever do. That's lovely. So it's like, if something is worth doing to you, it might be even more worth doing to someone else. That's incredible. Like, a lot of artists feel really bitter about these kind of things, and I can I can understand it. It's like, it sucks to not have your art be understood, but having your art be misunderstood kind of has its own value to it, because it gives you, like, a perspective on people you can't get otherwise, really. Like, I kind of hate, like, when I'm talking about something and people misunderstand it. I hate that. Someone misunderstands my art, as long as it's not, like, in an offensive way. It's kind of, it's funny. It's interesting. Because I, like, I make my art to, I do want to feel un more understood from my art, and I do think it does help with that. But at the same time, I think it's even more invaluable when people misunderstand it. And I get to understand how people would misunderstand something I'm drawing. How they'd have their own interpretation. And, like, how their own interpretation is, like, more valid than mine. Well, not more valid, but, like, just as valid than mine. Just as valid as the person who drew it. Like, by being an artist, you truly understand death of the author like just cause just cause the author might have had something specific in mind doesn't mean that the other interpretations are invalid to them they might prefer the other interpretations even like you can't go off the author's word long because like like they might prefer the weird fan theory. I think JK Rowling is that gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's not even just the, the transphobia, but just the just the like Yes, this is this is canon. This this person was gay. Yes, because people would like me if I if I said that. It's very interesting. I know I say it's very interesting a lot, but I like I'm talking about what's interesting to me. It's going to be interesting <laughs> to me. <laughs> Um, I'm excited to see how a show, a draw and talk, goes with someone else kind of at the helm. Like me interviewing someone, letting them be the star of the show. I think that will add some much needed variety. Letting them decide what I'm going to draw. having a conversation with them and I like I like that it's gonna just be my friends as well friends and family and whatever because you know I'm not I'm not gonna be able to interview you know someone that's really big someone that's famous I'm not I'm just not the show is like the regular person's show the show is about the regular person I make it less tech.
Shading is really fun. Sometimes it, the shading can be quite hard on a drawing if you don't really know what you're doing with it. But it's it's fun, it's been fun on this one. I'm just just genuinely enjoying drawing this. It's great. Miss design and characters that was just really fun to draw. Wait, don't do the highlights yet. That's a rule that I've heard and like I'm always tempted to not follow it but whenever I don't follow it it results in disaster usually. Like do the shading before the highlights. Sometimes I get a bit cheeky, but in general, I like to follow that, and I think it helps me a lot with making stuff I'm happy with. I didn't really like colouring when i was younger i didn't like coloring in my drawings i hated i actually hated coloring because i didn't see i didn't see what i could possibly add i was like it's there you know it's that why would i color i think a big part of that is because like it didn't feel expressive to me it felt like fill in these lines you know and what i enjoy drawing is I enjoyed just drawing characters and putting them in situations and all that. I didn't enjoy like coloring, but I enjoy coloring now. Like I might even enjoy coloring more than sketching now. Really, to be honest, I love it. Because I realised it can be expressive. I wonder how many other artists can relate to that, like not enjoying colouring, and then all of a sudden, once you you have that magic moment where you're like, oh, actually, colouring's great. I love colouring. And maybe if you're an artist that doesn't love colouring, maybe you'll have that moment as well where you love colouring. You love line art. And I didn't like line art as well. I was, I was really frustrated. I was like, how do I get those nice clean lines that everyone else seems to be able to get and I just can't. Now I can get nice clean lines. I worked really hard on being able to do that and it's something that I enjoy doing. You'll get there basically, you will. There we go. Just trying to make the little things under his eyes like a bit more prevalent because I enjoy them. Lots of dimensionality, lots of dimensionality. Love the dimensionality of it. Now let's add in a little bit more. I think size color wheel also really helped me learn to enjoy coloring and shading because it's just a way of understanding color that meshes with my brain very, very nice. And it gives it's given me an intuitive understanding of colour to to be using it for so long. Just kind of round this out a little bit. Like like what I was doing with Crash Bandicoot, like there's some light coming through. Some light coming through.
watched back some of this, by the way, and like in the Blink One Eight Two episode, there was like some weird technical difficulty where there would be like a popping, like a cutting out noise, and I think I figured it out. It it possibly was um some cables plugged in incorrectly possibly most likely it was i just had the because i knew some a preamp i had the gain on the preamp too high and you know it wouldn't cut like like because if you're new to using microphones and music and stuff you know stuff like there's a certain point in the program where it would cut out and like i wasn't getting that in the program but I was getting it in freaking the preamp. It would like cut out on the preamps end or like on the microphones end, like, or the preamps. End. I think it's the preamps end because it has like this little light that flashes up when it's like clipping. So it would cut out on that end. And. I know it's, and I thought that little flash was like the activity light, so whenever I saw that come up, I was like, oh, that's good. <laughs> it wasn't good. See, cringe. Cringe is fun. Cringe is nice. Cringe is human. Don't be ashamed. Okay, we're almost done with him. I'm really excited. That's looking nice. Um, I feel like he is a bit like he is getting a bit. Um, I don't know. I need to adjust it just a little bit. Oh no! Don't do that. Um, uh, yeah, no. No, I'm not gonna do any of that. Um, bit more contrast a little bit. That's interesting that that slider makes him turn blue. The blue kind of works for him in a weird way. Um, give him a bit more depth. That kind of makes him feel more viewable in my opinion. Um, we got to do the eyes. I've always said this, but like the eyes are what, if you have good eyes, the, the drawing is like half done. actually gonna give him like a proper pupil because this is his pupil because he's got weird yellow eyes so it's just kind of like a little highlight inside of the pupil that's nice enough I guess I kind of want I'm gonna color adjust again Yeah, kind of, um, colour just again. Alright, good. Okay. This is gonna, gonna do the shape first actually because I was about to get cheeky and do the highlights but like I said even on something like an eye shading first shading first
that's good. Like that. Okay, now all that's left is this kind of um beige kind of stuff I got going on. Maybe his tea. I'll do his tea first because I'll actually forget about those. Um Are these on a? They are, yeah. There we go. Boop, boop, boop. Just two of these horns, and that's good. I always like forget about something when I draw. I'm always like, wow, it's done, but not done. I think that's done. Um, I could do is. Hmm, there's some stuff I could do to finish this off. Now let's um crop. Let's give him some breathing room. Right, that's good. Let's let's see how he looks with a background, because I think I usually just have it transparent, but he might look nice with a background. Um have it. Mm. Could be a little bit darker. He'd look nice with a highlight, wouldn't he? Let's see if I can get a, a, a nice one on him. Let's see if this works. Um, Wait, I think there's actually a button for outline. Yeah, there is. Is that working? Oh, it is. It is working. But it's working in the wrong way. Oh, that looks nice. Um, but I'm gonna give it a bit. Gonna. Give it a bit of a. Ooh. Spiciness. 
Wait, actually, it'd be nice. Wouldn't it be nice if I did this color? This would be nice. Yeah, look. This looks like a Mr. Pongo Stan sticker. Oh, yeah. Stick this Mr. Pongo Stan wherever you feel. I want this sticker. I'm gonna stick him somewhere. Um. Well, that's Mr. Pern Ghost I'm done, which means this drawing talk is done. Thanks for tuning in. I'm really happy with how it went. And I'll see you hopefully next Friday. And hopefully I'll be able to get my friend on next Friday. And she can talk about Kirby. Alright.